Father, thank you for all that you're doing here. This is all you. It's your grace always being poured out. And Lord, we may not be large, but uh, these people, Father, they're following you. They're obedient to your word. And we see the results and how they take care of one another and how they grow and all those things that, that we see in the scriptures. So thank you for all of that. Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Your turn. Leaning Leaning on the everlasting arms Amen Leaning on his arms safe in his embrace experiencing a taste of the kingdom the here but not yet but it's coming the fullness of his kingdom may your kingdom come may your will be done On earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, establish your kingdom. Father, establish your will in my life. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come. May your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come, may your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus, establish your kingdom. Jesus, establish your will in my high life. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on her as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
It means we're agreeing with what he says. Amen. We're seeking to find out what his will is. We were talking about this Wednesday night. So often people, believers, think of prayer as a, a way to talk God into getting what you want. If we can just get him to change his mind. No, he's changing your mind. <laughs> so that you would receive his will that is already spoken in heaven. That you would agree that that is how it should be here on earth. And then you find yourself able to ask anything in his name because you're directly attached to his will. Is that one over there? This is because he's good. He's God. He's a good father, amen? Mm. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. Your good, good Father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide but i know we're all searching for answers only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word you're good Good Father, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to us again you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to love so undeniable I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you go me deeper still into love love your good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who I am, it's who I am. 
He is so good. Amen? He's good. Not just the way we define the word. But the way he defines it. He's good. He's righteous. He's holy. He's pure. He's God. Are you thirsty for more of him? Do you want more of God? I know it's tough when somebody asks that. All who are thirsty, all who are weak, just come to the fountain, dip your heart in the stream of life, let the pain and the sorrow be washed away. In the waves of his mercy, as deep cries out to deep, we sing, come. Come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. All who are thirsty, all who are we, just come to fountain dip your heart in the stream of life let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out to deep we sing Nothing but your will for me, I'm only free in Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Nothing but your will for me, I'm only free in you. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Nothing but your will for me, I'm only free in you. Come. thirsty come Lord Jesus Psalm 29 1 through 2 we read ascribe to the Lord O heavenly beings ascribe to the Lord glory and strength ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Holiness unto the Lord, unto the King. Holy 
unto your name I will sing holiness unto Jesus holiness unto you Lord holiness unto Jesus holiness unto you Lord I love you I love your ways I love your name I love you and all my days I'll proclaim holiness unto Jesus holiness unto you Lord holiness unto Jesus holiness unto you Lord holy sing it to him Unto Jesus, holiness, unto you, Lord, holiness, unto Jesus, holiness, unto you, Lord. Okay, you got this last verse. Here we go. you I love your way I love your name oh I see why I love you and all my days I'll proclaim holiness unto Jesus Holiness unto you, Lord. Holiness unto Jesus. Holiness unto you, Lord. Holiness unto He is worthy of all glory and all honor, all praise. We have come to exalt him today together. Father, we thank you. And Lord, we, we want to lift up uh, Patty Armstrong, Lord. Boy, she's had a couple tough weeks, Father, but this latest uh, fracturing her ankle needing a surgery father we just pray lord right now in jesus name that you would just heal her up just pour out your blessings upon her let her know that you're there with her let her sense your presence oh father i pray for the doctors that you give them wisdom on how to do all that and lord we pray for the hawks their missing dog i mean that's a big deal i think most of us know that pets become family members and when they're missing, it's hard. So, Father, we pray for your will to be done, that you give them answers and closure or something so that they know. And just be with them while they wait and while they watch. And, Lord, we thank you for 
friends that we haven't seen in a while here today with us. Just pray that you would bless them abundantly and meet all their needs. And for those that are here every Sunday, Lord, just bless them mightily. Thank you for their obedience to you and the witness that they provide. Lord, we give you all the glory. And in Jesus' name they said, amen. It's time to fellowship. Captain Jack there, uh, what's his name? Johnny Depp. And uh, Amber Heard trial, any of that? I heard it. Wow. Now that's entertainment. <laughs> Whoa. Anyways, I was reminded of that. And of course, Acts chapter 26, we, we are in Paul's trial or his hearing. It's more of a hearing, really. There's no trial. But uh, it, it's set up in a kind of a court fashion. So I thought we'd use a little courtroom humor. So as we've been progressing along, watching Paul having to deal with uh, the Roman government and the Jewish hierarchy and everybody's trying to kill him and the Romans are trying to keep him alive and, and he has to go through all this stuff. It's, the stage is set for God's providential plan to proclaim the gospel to imperial dignitaries, to the military officials, to city officials, and even a king. So we've seen all this come together. Now we know that, that, that Christ came to Paul in that vision in the night when he was pretty much down a bit. And he said, hey, you know, rise up there, son. I'm sending you to Rome. You're going to do what I need you to do there. And uh, so then we see how all of this then begins happening after that. And Paul, you can just kind of see him rising like, like the, the phoenix from the ashes, rising up out of that uh, in prison, that jail, whatever they want to call that thing. And he, we see him starting to get bolder and bolder and bolder. And so God is fulfilling what he told him he was going to do with him. So don't you love it when a plan comes together? So does the A-team. That's for those of you that are old enough to remember. Governor uh, Festus is seeking some insight from King Agrippa. Remember we talked about last week that Agrippa and his sister Bernice, you know, the two from West Virginia, that's a joke, never mind. <laughs> but at any rate, they're there, and, and Festus, being the Roman governor, he, he doesn't know what to do with all this, because he's got, he's got the Jews on one side that are screaming and yelling, do away with him, blah, 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 but he knows he can't do that. And then Paul, finally, seeing the writing on the wall, says what? I appeal to Caesar. He's a Roman citizen. He can do that. And everything stopped. All right? You've appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you shall go. But then next... King Agrippa shows up. King Agrippa is, is, is half Jewish. He's one of the Herods from way back. We'll look at that in just a second. But Festus wants to get Agrippa's opinion on what's going on because he's supposed to know about the customs and the controversies among the Jews in the Palestine and Judea and all that. So he figures this is a, this is a, a fortunate situation that this guy is here. So he's going to present Paul before him and see what he has to say about all this. Maybe he can give him some, because he's got to send Paul to Rome, and he's got to send him with a letter explaining what, why he's on his way up there, what he's doing there. And he, got, he has to make himself look good in the letter, right? So he's looking for ways to write this. So he's going, he's going to King Agrippa to find out. So they invite Paul to make a defense of the charges against him, uh, and, and Paul's figuring he's got this knowledgeable judge, if you will, Agrippa. He's not really a judge, but he's kind of judging the proceedings. And a non-antagonistic audience in attendance. I thought that was a sigh of relief. Usually he's got an audience that's screaming, kill him, kill him. You know, it's kind of hard to keep a train of thought. When you got that going on. So Paul has this opportunity to make his case. And by the end of the presentation, even though Festus interrupts, saying, are you out of your mind? Paul has preached the gospel. 
He's provided insight to how and why God saves sinners, and he put the fear of God in everyone that was listening. God wins. This is exactly what he said he was going to do with them, and he's doing it. Now, of particular interest for all of us, because we're believers, is, is the section we're going to get to with Paul's reflection on kicking against the goads. How many of you thought that was kicking against the goats? You know, you read it real fast, you go, why is he kicking goats? You know, I don't know. I usually just barbecue him, but that's another story. This accusation regarding opposition to God's discipline and direction, which is what this is, because when, when God speaks to him, why are you? You know, it was, it was the risen Christ, of course, during the Damascus Road conversion. But he said to him, it's not easy. It's not good. Kick against the goads. Dummy. He didn't say dummy. I added that. But he's trying to tell him, you need to buckle under here, buddy. I'm choosing you to do this. <laughs> you don't have any choice. This is my will. And you're going to serve me. Well, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, who you persecute. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I didn't mean it. It was just those other idiots that I said, those idiots are my body. You persecute them, you persecuted me. Now, rise up and let's go. Wouldn't that have been something to see, to experience? Wow. You see, we're going to look at this whole thing about kicking against the goads, which is God's discipline and direction in our lives. We'll be asking ourselves, why do we kick against the goads? Why do we find ourselves doing that even today? So, sum up the introduction. Paul's defense before Agrippa II is a powerful presentation, and it's regarding God's glorious plan of redemption of both Jew and Gentiles, and the need for all to respond to the proclamation of the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ. And it's a challenge for believers to obey God's plan and direction in their lives. So this is right for you. The scripture is speaking to each one of us today, as well as referencing what went on 2,000 years ago. Let's look at our first point. Paul's on trial for the hope in the resurrection. Now, when we say it, we don't think much about it. The resurrection, of course, yeah. We just had Easter, right? Easter service. Everybody talks about the resurrection. We know what that is, rising from the dead, and Jesus coming back for his own life. Boy, this was hot topic in this situation. In fact, this is one of the reasons the Jews are asking for his head, because he believes in the hope of the resurrection, because it's all brought about by Christ, the Messiah that's been rejected. So you can see now, this is tense. This is drama. This is good stuff. Let's start with verse 1 of chapter 26. So Agrippa said to Paul, you know, they brought him in and all that, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand, it's kind of a greeting, and made his defense. He says, I consider myself fortunate that it's before you. King Agrippa, I'm going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and the controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you, listen to me patiently. Wouldn't you like that? Man, you got to remember that this, this hearing is pomp and circumstance. Everybody's dressed up. The, the military guys are wearing all their red and you know, their military flourish and all that. And you got the king there, and Bernice is there, and of course Festus, the government, wearing his best toga, I guess. You know, everybody's dressed up because this is a big event. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Wow, that's pretty bold. You know, for a short, bold-legged, bald guy, Nobody even flinched. All right. All right. Just checking. 
with funny eyebrows and everything else that they tried to piece together about this guy. He's one bold character, isn't he? He says, as he begins his defense, My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, it's known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, I am accused by Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Now, you really got to know what's going on here. He just closed the trap. <laughs> what are you going to say? He's already set them up. Let's look. Paul begins his defense with proper acknowledgement of King Agrippa. You know, he's kind of kissing up a little bit. He states how fortunate he is to have a qualified person in Jewish controversies and customs to hear his case. Now, think about that for a minute. He's had the Jewish hierarchy yelling at him for two years now. And he's saying, you know, it's really nice that I have someone here that knows the rear end from page 8, as my coach used to say. Paul is complimenting Agrippa as being more qualified to hear this case than those scalp-hunting Sanhedrin type. Paul states that his bona fides are well known from his youth under the teaching of Gamaliel until his ascension to Pharisaic status. His only guilt is being a more faithful Jew than his accusers. Wow, this is all going on between the lines here. Can you imagine the boldness of this guy? That just had to hurt when they heard that. Of course, a lot of the, the people that he was having real trouble with, they weren't allowed in, but everybody got what he meant. Paul encourages Agrippa to sit back and prepare to be amazed at the story he's going to tell. Now, while Agrippa was considered to be a pious man, and that was his reputation, he worked well with the Jews, he understood the, the, the law, he understood, he was part Jewish, he understood the controversies, he understood the, this new movement called The Way, which was following this supposedly risen from the dead Jewish carpenter. He knew all this stuff. And yet, Agrippa was still a member of the worldly ambitious, and morally corrupt family of the Herods. For generations, the Herods had opposed God's plan of redemption. You remember Herod the Great? He attempted to murder the infant Jesus by ordering the slaughter of all male children, two years old or younger. That's the old man. His son, Herod Antipas, had John the Baptist beheaded. His grandson, Agrippa I, ordered James, the son of Zebedee, one of Jesus' twelve apostles, executed by the sword just to please the Jews. Wow. You know, if Paul were nervous about the track record of the Herods, he didn't show it. I'd have been shaken. But he seems to be pretty bold. Speaking of the morally corrupt... Sitting next to Herod, as we talked about last week, is his sister Bernice. Now, the Jewish historian Josephus notes that Bernice could be very devout during a crisis. Why? Because she knew how to play the game. She was a political animal. Bernice was a power prostitute. That's my term. Literally and figuratively, and history records this, her conduct was so scandalous that later... When she was the Emperor Titus's mistress, he had to send her away due to the moral outcry of pagan Rome. She was too much for the pagans to handle. Wow! I'm thinking all sorts of things in my head, and I will not say them. As an opportunistic consort to men of power, 
She knew how to play the political power game. And this is probably what Josephus was alluding to. This incestuous power couple of brother and sister was bereft of any virtue to sit in judgment of Paul. The irony of it all. God has a sense of humor. But then again, we know that sometimes God uses spiritually bankrupt people to accomplish his purposes. I ask you to consider Judas or Bill Clinton. Now, this gathering of the glitterati in Caesarea, it's not a legal proceeding because Paul's already been considered innocent. I mean, they all know that he's innocent, so they just want to hear what he has to say. But Festus is looking at this little, you know, confab as a political political opportunity to score some points with the movers and shakers of Judea. Agrippa thinks, well, this is an acknowledgement of his importance to the empire. That's why he's here. And Paul, on the other hand, sees this hearing as an opportunity to explain the motivation for his life and ministry, which is the proclamation of the gospel. He never lost sight of that. We saw that Paul, in the scriptures here, briefly recites his youthful education, his ascendancy to the Pharisaic party. And so in Paul's mind, there is no Jew more adamant than he concerning the law of God. And we saw that in in, in his defense in the previous chapter. I mean, he just went after him. He said, look, you know, I've got all the reputation for being really better than y'all about this stuff. They didn't like that. And it is, as he's presenting all this, as he's putting all this out from this position and his reputation of enforcing strict Judaism, Paul pivots and catches everybody off guard. It's a classic move. It's great. They're all watching and thinking, man, this guy's bold. This guy's... This guy. Whoa! What? What is he saying? And that's where we're going. You see, we've been alerted to the main theme here. Paul uses the word hope three times. And he asserts that he's on trial for his hope in the promise of God to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the people of Israel. He's on trial for his hope in the promise of God to the fathers and the people of Israel. And what is the great hope and promise? It is the hope that God raises the dead. It is the hope in resurrection life that will result in ruling and reigning with God throughout eternity. And by the way, in the New Testament, when you find the word hope, it's not a wishy-washy hope like in English. Oh, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope that comes to pass, but I'm not sure. I hope. No, in the New Testament, it's guaranteed. You can switch the word to guaranteed. The only difference and the reason they call it hope is it hasn't happened yet but it's guaranteed. So in the Greek, when they're using the word hope, they mean it's a done deal. We're just waiting for it all to happen. Now, here's what's going down. Paul's claiming that his Jewish faith in the resurrection is not a violation of Jewish heritage. Rather, The roots of his new faith in Christ are, in fact, ancient. They are the hope and fulfillment of the new covenant promise made to the fathers and to the prophets. Jesus' Jesus's suffering and resurrection are seen as the fulfillment of the Jewish messianic hope. And the irony here is that it is the Jewish hierarchy, those that should have known this truth that are bringing charges against Paul. Remember Nicodemus coming by night? Part of the Jewish hierarchy. Pharisee. Everything. He's up there. He's one of the teachers of Israel. And remember, you must be born again. He says, how do you do that? I can't crawl up into my mother's womb again. What are you talking about? And Jesus said to him, what did he say? You? Now, I don't think he, he said it mean. I think he said it so that it would just 
drill itself into him. You are a teacher of Israel, and you don't know this stuff? You see what the problem was? They didn't know their stuff. That's why they rejected the Messiah. He wasn't the Messiah they wanted. Well, too bad, so sad. But God sends the Messiah he wants to send. And you must receive him. Or you're in deep kimchi. Okay? you got problems. And that's what Paul's trying to get across. So in his typical theological parlance, Paul is saying that the Jew must become a Christian in order to remain a true Jew. Let that hang out there like one big, huge matzo ball. Can you imagine what they're thinking? This begs the question, well then, who is a true Jew? Is it someone born of a Jewish mother? That's kind of the old standard thing. Is it a person born in Israel? Is it someone with a Berg, Stein, Witz, or Weiss as a surname suffix? According to the scripture, a true Jew is one who is circumcised of the heart and is of the seed of Abraham through faith, not bloodline, through faith in Christ. Can you imagine how this was going over? I bet people were gasping for air. Like, he actually said this in public. But Paul and I digress. Let's return to the conversion story, because there's a lot in there. Point two is Paul's opposition to the gospel and his conversion. So what we're seeing is he's giving his testimony before King Agrippa and all the other dignitaries that are there. He's giving his testimony. Do you ever give your testimony? Think about it. Think about how powerful that must be. If in this instance, historically speaking, that he's giving his testimony. We would think he'd be doing some sort of great, you know, riff on Romans, you know, the great theological book that he wrote. No, no, no. He's giving his testimony. He's telling them what God did and then letting them deal with that. Verse 9, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. This is after, of course, he grew up, and this, that, and the other was a Pharisee. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Have you ever thought about that he carried that the rest of his life? You can imagine why he understood God's grace so sufficiently, so deeply. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities, which is what he was doing on the Damascus Road. He had warrants for arrest. He was headed to Damascus. Big Jewish population there. Verse 12, in this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, which tells us this was an external phenomenon. It wasn't just something in his head. It just wasn't a vision. Everybody hit the dirt. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, which would have been Aramaic in this context, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Ah. <sighs> I wonder how long Jesus waited until he said the next thing. Just let that hang there. Because, you know, Paul's doing 180 miles an hour in his brain, trying to figure out what in the world is happening here. And Jesus says, but rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, 
to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul says, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, throughout all the regions of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I've had the, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Of course, that just incensed the Jewish heart. Paul was a violent persecutor of Christians. And Christ arrested him on the road to Damascus. And he appeared to him in a theophany of some type. He accused him of persecuting him. Which brings to mind the fact that when we go after brothers and sisters, you've got to be careful you're going after Jesus. So you want to make sure you got your ducks in a row if you've got to confront someone. The Lord commands Paul to become his witness to both the Jews and the Gentiles. His proclamation of the gospel will be the vehicle by which unbelievers will open their eyes in order to turn from darkness to light and receive forgiveness of sins and adoption into God's family. And all this by faith in the risen Lord Jesus. Now Paul sees his preaching as the confirmation of all that the prophets and Moses preached concerning the, the atoning work of Christ and his resurrection from the dead. He's saying, I am confirming everything God spoke to our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel. I am telling you what that was all about. Do you hear me? See, Christ is the first fruits of resurrection for all who believe. Now, the inclusion of the Gentiles was definitely irritating to the Jews, for they believed there was no possibility that God would allow Gentiles to share in divine eschatological blessings. Well, you talk about being bigots. Man, you get, it's all you ever hear on our news, right? Everybody's a racist. Everybody's a bigot. Man, we need lessons. Some of these people are really good at it. Add to that the fact that Paul claims to represent true Judaism, and we can see why the Jewish leadership wanted him dead. Of special interest to us, though, is in Paul's conversion experience. It's the statement of fact that Christ speaks to Paul. He says, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. So everybody's going, what's a goad? And what does it metaphorically mean in this situation? A goad is a stick like a pool cue, sharpened on one end and used to prod and direct an animal. You used the phrase before, oh, he was just prodding me. That's where it comes from. You poke them. Now, if they kick against the goad, they're, they're going to kick and get speared in the leg. And that's what Jesus is telling them. You see, an animal that kicked at the goad would be poked and, of course, causing greater pain. Jesus is telling Paul to quit acting like an unbroken horse, kicking against the goads. Paul is chase, 
chastised for kicking against God's discipline and God's direction. This would be like us reading and ignoring the sign, do not back up, severe tire damage in a parking garage. You see, rebelling against that command is not only stupid, but it's damaging and very expensive. In the visitation on the Damascus Road, the risen Christ is calling Paul to cease fighting divine destiny. If God is sovereign, and he is, he's got our life planned out. The question is, what are you doing about it? Are you fighting it? Or are you obeying? Are you trying to back yourself up over the spikes? Or you decide to go on through? You see, the issue about fighting divine destiny in our lives that issue settled on earth because it's already settled in heaven. You're not going to go with what God tells you to do. You're fighting God, and you will not win. It's very difficult, the things you'll find yourself in the middle of. So are you hearing the voice of God directing you to greater obedience and more production of spiritual fruit? I want you to listen to, I thought this was interesting. It was in Fortune Magazine, January 1940. Listen to this. So long as the church pretends or assumes to preach absolute values, but actually preaches relative and secondary values, it will merely hasten the process of disintegration. You see that all around. We are asked to turn to the church for our enlightenment. But when we do so, we find the voice of the church is not inspired. The secular magazine, 1940, they thought the world was about over. You're right there in the middle of World War II. They're all wondering what God's up to. The voice of the church today, we find, is the echo of our own voices. When we consult the church, we hear only what we ourselves have said. There is only one way out of the spiral, and the way out is the sound of a voice. Not our voice, but a voice coming from something beyond ourselves, in the existence of which we cannot disbelieve. It is the duty of the pastors to hear this voice, to cause us to hear it, and to tell us what it says. 1940, Secular Magazine. Wow! They understood it. They got it. They know what was happening. You can't kick against the goads. God's in control. He's sovereign. He's got a plan. You don't get to mess with the plan. I don't get to mess with it. It's going to happen. Now, the question is, what kind of a body bag do you want to be in when you get there? I want to be in one that's got holes poked in it so I can keep breathing. But I imagine I'm going to get stuffed in one kind of the way I act. So, But at any rate, you get the drift. Don't fight him. Don't kick against the goats. You've got to identify what the goats are in your life. That's why you're here today. The voice is calling us to quit kicking against the goats. What goads are you kicking against? And that's the next question, right? Why are you kicking against God's discipline and direction? God's calling you into divine service. Well, that's quite an honor. And that's why he saved you to serve the kingdom. You were saved to serve. Do you know what God has called you to do? Think about it. Have you chosen instead to kick against the goats? Why be like Jonah? God's going to win in the end. Or 
worst case scenario, he may allow you to miss out on his call. Ouch. How will you feel when the realization of that comes home to roost? We're Christ's servants. We're his hands and his feet. We're to share the love we have received with those Jesus brings our way. Otherwise, you're just marking time until your last breath. Point three, Paul, are you out of your mind? Christmas, I love it. Verse 24, and as he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, poor Paul, I keep getting interrupted. Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. You know, that's what every speaker wants to hear in the middle of his presentation. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words, for the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, notice, did you see what just happened? Festus interrupts the whole thing like Satan, you know, in drag. What are you out of your mind? What are you doing? And Paul goes, no, I know what I'm doing. Now you shut up. He's after Agrippa. He's barreling in. He's going for the death blow. Here we go. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, eh, except for these chains. That's bold, my friends. Verse 30, then the king arose, and the governor, and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, this man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this, could, this man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. They knew he was innocent the whole time. But they kept pushing it. You say, well, why? They're just mean. No, God was in control. God told them, you're going to Rome, and you're going to be proclaiming the gospel to some pretty heavy-duty players. And this is how he's getting him there. As Paul's gospel witness rounds the final turn and heads towards the finish line. Festus freaks out, interrupting all the proceedings, accusing Paul of being out of his mind. But poor Paul, he's always getting interrupted near the conclusion. He got interrupted by the mob of the temple. He got interrupted by the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the council. And now Festus, I mean, he's this close to closing the deal, and all of a sudden he gets interrupted. When you are proclaiming the gospel, always expect some type of interruption. Those of you that know what I'm talking about, you know. The devil doesn't go down easy. He's working hard to keep people lost as best he can. He'll figure something out to interrupt. He always tries to sil silence your testimony before someone makes a decision. So don't give up. It's just a distraction. You see, Paul didn't give up. He just pivoted real quick. Let Festus keep standing there looking like an idiot. He went after Agrippa, and Agrippa knew it was coming. You know, people know when you're proclaiming the gospel to them, right? They, they, they understand what's happening. And he was going like, oh, man, i got to get out of this situation. Everybody's looking. But Paul wasn't stopped. He just kept going. God is in control, and he's the one that's responsible for drawing people to himself through the foolishness of our preaching and our witnessing. To some, our preaching is folly, but those who are called know what it is. And that's what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians. For the Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, and there it is again. A stumbling block to Jews and folly or foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Believers, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So what we have here is Festus 
He's a typical Roman practical materialist. He just could not figure out what was wrong with Paul. I mean, here this guy, he's given him every chance to kind of get out of the situation. And Paul is dogged in what he's up to, all right? His obedience to Christ. It doesn't matter what kind of persecution is coming towards him. He's hanging in there. He keeps going. And that offended Festus's instinctive hedonism. He's a Roman. He thought Paul was insane for choosing a path that limited pleasure and increased suffering. And like other Romans, Festus gave lip service to Roman gods, but in reality, he worshipped imperial fortune, which is the prominence and success of the empire. We see that Festus was first and last a politician. And as a sensible Roman, he could not believe in the resurrection of anyone, much less a Galilean carpenter. To him, it was just all folly. And being politically and spiritually correct was everything to Festus. Does that sound like anything going on with our politicians? Maybe our neighbors, our family, co-workers? As we saw, Paul deflects Festus' insult and calls for a response from Agrippa. The king knows everything that Paul is saying is public knowledge. His words are true, and nothing has been done in secret. Paul's out there. He's open. And Paul calls on Agrippa to acknowledge his faith in the words of the prophets, which would demand a decision for Christ as being the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan. You see what Paul did to him? He set him up. He said, choose ye this day whom you're going to serve. He'd give him in his testimony. He knew where this guy was coming from. And he set him up in public. That was interesting. Now, Agrippa is too proud to confess anything, and he takes evasive action with a counter question. In a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul says, yeah, I want everyone in the sound of my voice to make a decision to follow Christ. And so the encounter ends. Festus, Agrippa, Bernice, and the other prominent people, they all conclude that Paul is guilty of nothing, warranting prisoner death. And Agrippa states that Paul could be on his way home if he hadn't appealed to Caesar, but instead Paul is on his way to Rome. Now, Paul's defense and proclamation of the gospel is a legal success, but it changes nothing. He's still chained by injustice, yet providence is victorious. The next stop, Rome. We wrap it up. Paul has provided us an example of being ready at any time to fearlessly share the good news of Jesus Christ. If we want to share Christ with others, God will provide the opportunities. You want to. Just ask Him. He will. That's why you're here. To give your testimony. To tell them about Jesus. The Great Commission, remember that? That whole thing? That's why we're here. You want an opportunity to share your faith, to share the gospel? Just ask him. Acts 26 reveals a mature Paul after many years of faithful service. You know, we got to look through and, and watch Paul progress over the years and see, you know, he, he was kind of an interesting character and he was dealing with his own issues as he went along and did what God wanted him to do and he'd get stoned in one place and rise up and go back in and, and we saw all this going on. But now we're seeing him after years of service and he's teaching us something. He's giving us wisdom. Prior to preaching to kings, governors, and other high-ranking officials, Paul had to surrender to Christ on the Damascus Road. We know he was told to quit kicking against God's plan and get on with living in obedience and bearing spiritual fruit. The results of Paul's obedience fill many pages of the New Testament. As we have seen time and again, Paul's conversion testimony is the launching pad for his proclamation of the gospel. And that's a lesson for us. 
We cannot intellectually win people to Christ. It's not about who's smart and who's not. That, that's not how this works. God draws people to himself, and then he puts you in that proximity and has you preach the gospel to them. You're not going to win them over with smooth talk. If that's all it took, we'd hire Madison Avenue, make the greatest, the slickest uh, advertisement about coming to Christ and pump it on Fox and the mainstream media and, and everything everybody watches because it's just so good intellectually that they just have to believe in Christ. Does it work that way? Of course not. God draws people to himself. But he needs us there to present the gospel. It's a work only God can do, saving people. However, we are responsible for telling our story about what Jesus did for us. The gospel of Christ, the good news of Christ, is simple. And here it is. And we've heard this a hundred times. All of sin. So everybody's up to their neck in a porta potty, right? All have sinned. Nobody's escaping this. Therefore, number two, all will experience God's wrath. Nobody's good enough to get away from that. Nobody can do this. Nobody can do that. So that God says, well, you're pretty good. You're okay. I'll let you come. No. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. However, because that's, that's kind of heavy news, those first two, right? But the third one is that Jesus came to rescue us from God's wrath. Ha ha! A lifeboat, a lifeline. A life ring has been thrown to us as we bob up and down in the sea of sin and we can't get ourselves out. God has provided a way of escape from his wrath. Because it's coming. Because he's a righteous and a holy God, his wrath is coming upon the unrighteous. So, number four, trust in Christ and receive forgiveness and adoption into God's family. That's why it's called the good news. The gospel is good news. The good news is you're messed up and you're going to hell in a handbasket fast. But God has taken care of the sin issue for you. Receive Christ. Say yes to him as Lord and Savior. That's the gospel. There's nothing to it, really. It's just a statement of facts that all come from the scripture. Jesus took our punishment and gave us his righteousness. And they all said, all right, that's the rescue. He took our sins upon himself on the cross and in, imputed to us his very righteousness so that the sin issue no longer is a plague for us. We're good to go. That's good news. As you can see, the gospel's not complicated, and you don't have to be a genius to share it or to receive it. What makes your gospel presentation compelling for the person hearing it is you. Did you ever consider how important your testimony is about what God has done for you? Now we think, well, you know, everybody has a testimony and people get bored. No, if you've been put in a situation where God's having you witness to someone, give them your testimony as part of the gospel presentation, just like Paul did. Because it's you that's telling it. And they're there because God wants them there to hear your story. That's how important you are. Your story is compelling because you're telling it. And people that are there because God brought them there, they're intrigued because they know you. And they can't figure out why God would save you. Your personal testimony is a powerful narrative of what Christ did for you. Your personal story is what God has provided you for doing the work of an evangelist. We all are evangelists. That's why we're here. Tell how Jesus forgave your sin and rescued you from hopelessness and changed your life, filling you with his presence. 
Let them know that Jesus has promised you eternal life and that you will rule and reign with Him through eternity. Relate how God has always been faithful in your journey. You ever read Pilgrim's Progress? That whole journey of Pilgrim as he's going through the Christian life and going to all those different weird places and trying to overcome them? That's our story. We've lived this. That's why that book is such a famous book. That's the story of all of us. Tell your story your way. Now, you've got to keep the gospel in mind all the time, but tell it your way. You seen that commercial for the casinos in Arizona? Where the guy goes, you do you. It always makes, reminds me of this. You do you. Tell them yours. You know, no, i got to get the pastor to come over and witness to him. No, you don't. God didn't bring him to the pastor. He brought him to you. Your story is exactly what they need. And God knows that. You see, God knows everything about the person you are witnessing to because he brought them to you. He has more confidence in you than you have in yourself. He trusts you to witness of his great love and forgiveness. So remember, God is responsible for the results. You're not. You're responsible to share, but you're not responsible for the results. God is. That's his business there. It's time to quit kicking against the goads and obey the Great Commission. God is calling us to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in Christ. And that, my friends, is a high calling and a very special privilege. Father, we thank you that you have called us to serve you, to proclaim the gospel. We thank you for your word where we see Paul doing that very thing, giving his testimony over and over and over, and then launching with a proclamation of the gospel. Thank you for showing us this over and over and over in your word. Now, Father, as we go here and spend time in prayer throughout the day and whenever, Lord, that we would have the courage to ask for you to give us opportunities. Send people our way. And Father, give us the courage and the joy of just sharing our story about what you've done for us. And in Jesus' name, they said, amen. You're just